Okay, hello. So after some problems, I think I can start. So my name is Marek. I'm digital ASIC designer in TDK, and I have also a verification background. So this presentation will be about CocoTB, but from different perspective. So I was using CocoTB for my PhD, but now I'm trying to use also as a professional tool to provide the full verification sign-off. So I have some comments. Is, it Coco, is CocoTB a good tool for comprehensive verification? What is missing? What can be fixed? And so on. So agenda, it's rather a bit mixed topics. So first I would like to give some of you that don't know flavor, what is the functional verification? Because there may be some misunderstanding. What is comprehensive verification? Which elements I believe are critical for, for verification sign-off? Why everyone hates system very lock and UVM? And what is the future? That's actually very interesting. What creators of system very lock say about its future? And this is a thesis I'm repeating every time that functional verification is actually software. So this is a bit strange that people with only hardware background are trying to do verification. I will present CocoTB extensions that I prepared and a few words about how is CocoTB used in TDK for commercial projects. I added this slide today in the morning just to show you how verification is important. Actually, this line is very interesting. One company guy, I asked how much time you spent on verification. He said 100%. <laughs> so how is it possible? And he said, we already did all design. So and if you think about it, design like FPU, MMU, it's already done. So if you're building new chips, it's all, you only change configuration, you go with higher speed, but pretty much design may remain the same. So you change configuration. But you have to verify if blocks are working together because that, that changes. Design is fun and verification is hard. So many projects, what we have seen yesterday about spinal or chisel, so this is about the design. But the main problem is verification because it, because it takes so much time. So the real advantage I could see from this higher level of description in hardware that we could have advantage because of verification that it could be easier. And it's interesting to, to say that some projects can actually afford limited scope of verification. So what we have seen yesterday with Palpino, for example, you can tape out the design yeah, and check if it works. That's, that's also fine for some cases. But of course, if you are trying to verify very complex design, that's not an option. And one more thing, bugs are tricky. Bugs are not only about something doesn't work or the output is unexpected. It's also about you losing performance. You're losing power, for example, because your design, your design is flipping. Why it shouldn't? Some bugs are related to some timing issues, for example, to metastability, which is also you can observe once on a few hours of normal working of chip. So this is why it's so important. These bugs may not be critical for the function of your design, but if you want to be 100% sure that everything is Fine, then you have to conduct a comprehensive verification. So what is functional verification? Because we have to distinguish between formal and functional. So functional is about simulation. So you're basically applying some stimuli to the DUT and you're observing the DUT reaction. Formal verification is different approach. Formal formal is actually proving something with your design. So there is no simulation at all. It may be, of course, there are some taming dependencies, but it's not simulation. So basic example of functional verification is, of course, directed test when you have stimuli and you just observe what's the output, but that's too easy. In more complex cases, you design environments, so this is the infrastructure around everything you do. 
And one more thing to mention, there are several platforms that you can use. What we speak most of the time are simulators. So this is like Verilator, like Icarus, Incisive, VCS, Mentor, QuestaSim. But there are also different, different platforms like emulators. It's like big PCs and of course FPGAs. So each of these platforms has different capabilities of performance versus debug. So for example, with simulators, it's, you, can, you have very good visibility. You can test your blocks pretty well. But if you would like to boot Linux on your CPU simulation, that will take weeks. What is TestBench? TestBench is, like I said, verification environment. So it's all you build around your design to test it. So it's interesting to look at the test bench that actually you have some layers that are translating your logic signals into some higher level of abstraction, which you may call transactions, but that's not the point. And at this level above, it's pure software. So your test scenario, of course, you can distinguish some scoreboard, you can some monitoring like higher level of abstractions, you define your pass-fail conditions. But this is all software, right? We, we don't have logic signals anymore at this level. So what is advanced verification? So those are concepts which are very much linked to professional verification sign-off that you observe in, in companies. So first is constraint random verification. So it, it's about applying random stimuli. To, to your design. This, this approach gives you a high boost in terms of mm, testing functionality, in terms of achieving your coverage goals. But when you go random, you have to monitor what you actually test. So here comes the another concept, which is metrics-driven verification. And meeting these metrics using, for example, regression is, is actually the modern verification sign-off. So you can tell that modern verification goal is to satisfy defined metrics. So that's the definition of comprehensive verification. OK, so now about verification, how it looks today. So system Verilog was mentioned several times. The history is interesting. We, we started with Verilog, which was pure hardware description language. And then gradually, some high-level programming features were introduced in System Verilog. So I think the last release was in 2015 or 16. So there is support for the techniques I mentioned, so for constraint random and metric driven, but they solved it using dedicated syntax, which is quite awful because it's special syntax to, to use it. And what's even worse, if you are simulating system very long, then your simulator have to have to support this syntax. So pretty much simulator became really complex environments now. And UVM became like the methodology built on the top of system very long. So it's like the set of base classes that are supposed to resolve some problems. It's implemented in system very long. But if you look what is UVM in terms of software language? It's just a framework. It's just a set of base classes that you have to align in special order to, to work as, as you wish. <coughs> and this apparently became a reference for digital verification. So if you ask, do you use UVM, that it's pretty much understood like, do you perform comprehensive verification? But that's obviously not the truth. So both standard system Verilog and UVM were maintained and created by Accelera. Accelera is like organization made by EDA and for EDA. So it's interesting to see how the new feature is implemented in standard and it really takes years. So that's why system Verilog is, is looking so from the 90s today. It's so outdated technology because this cycle is very long. So EDA industry is creating problems 
trying to resolve it, implementing features, and then simulator from the same companies have to implement these features. So this is a process that takes a lot of time. So the effect is that systems very low and UVM are hated, but became a standard because EDA companies are pushing to use it. But UVM also has some good points because it facilitates reuse. Yeah, if, you, if you have this very modulated module-based approach, then you can share the modules between different projects and that should be quite easy to understand. But that's true only if you know UVM very well. And there are very few people that, that are fluent in this area. And it's another thing which is verification IPs, so that's interesting. It's like protocol related set of tests or monitors, also sold by EDA companies. And they are also very often based on UVM. So this is like still EDA companies are pushing to keep UVM alive. Interesting what very low creators say about the future, so they don't believe the system very lock is going to be developed anymore. And they see the C++ as the next generation for verification. System very lock users want to have normal programming language for using, for resolving their problems. But managers keep talking that UVM is good because it's UVM. So as I already mentioned, you can look at functional verification at different level. So remain simulation only for the DUT, so only for HDL. Do not use simulator for verification. HVL is for hardware verification language. Then your simulator doesn't need to support all these functions implemented in system Verilog. And then you can finally use free simulators, for example, Icarus. And then your test bench is just standalone application separated from the digital simulation. But of course, you need some API to, to connect two things together. So for very long, this is VPI. But as it was one question before, there is obvious a performance problem. But is it really a problem for everyone? So I think Luke's point was that you gain so much productivity while implementing test bench that you don't actually care that your simulation takes a bit longer. So looking from this perspective, digital verification is software. And the answer for this is CocoTB. So this is a picture from CocoTB. So that's exactly implementation of this idea. So you have simulator only for simulation. You have connection by VPI for very long. And all the test bench is pure software. And uh, that's how it works. But it's quite different from system very long and UVM. So it's difficult to persuade people to use it. There is no support for, for constraint randomization and metric driven verification. There is no clear methodology how to use it. And probably most important, there is no proof for scalability for, of CocoTB. But on the other hand, it's fast ramp up, it's fun. Python is easy and has various frameworks. So about my extensions. So I implemented these extensions related to constraint randomization and metric driven verification. So that was possible thanks to high level features of Python language. So for example, you can look at the constraint as like an arbitrary function. So thanks to this approach, you can define pretty much constraints the same way as in system Verilog. And I implemented API very similar to that one known from system Verilog. So if you look at the example, here is system Verilog. You can do pretty much the same in Python, exactly using this approach. OK, I skip that. So for functional coverage, it's pretty much the same. So we can use functions to, to collect the coverage. We can use decorators. And also, I implemented some primitives known from 
system very log. So like cover points, cover crosses, and it's how it looks in Python. You can do exactly the same and you can do more. And this is some complex example. You can do very cool thing, which is randomizing your transaction based on observed coverage. So this is so easy in Python. Try to do this in system very log. Okay, so how is used in my professional work? So DSP is about printing results, doing some filtration, doing some post-processing. So this is very easy with Python with some frameworks. Yeah, so, so this is how typical test bench looks. You have DUT, but you still need some reference model, you still need some post-processing, some comparisons and some presentation. So this is like ideal task for Python. And look how easy it is. You simply generate the data, do some filtration, you can have outputs, you can have your spectrograms, decimation, and it's really, again, try to do this in system very long. And the last slide is about some advanced verification problems that will be important in the future. So first topic is safety, so whether the design is actually resistant to failures. So for example, if we have an environment with some bad EMI properties, so what happens with the design? Is it possible to deadlock the design if there is fault, like dynamic fault inside? the chip. Second topic is verification for security, what was also mentioned. So it's not enough to tell that the design works, but we also have to tell if, you, if the design itself is safe. So again, functional verification is, is not enough. And also, last but not least topic is like, maybe it's possible to unify verification at different stages because pretty much people do the same as the RTL verification, when we do prototyping and when we do, we do post-silicon, then some parts of tests are the same. So once again, to repeat, digital hardware verification is software. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, I'm not going to ask about formal methods. <laughs> my, my question is, um, you discussed constrained random uh, verification. And from a, for, well, from a formal method standpoint, at some point you get to where it's very difficult to formally approve something and you almost have to rely on simulation and functional verification methods. Uh, such as you discussed today using CocoTB. Um, my question for you, though, is how much constrained random variable do you have to put into a design to know that it works? It depends on protocol, on how you test. So I, actually, I haven't mentioned that, but in this approach, there is like separate solver used for constraints. So I just made a f like framework, like API, but you still have to have like separate solver for constraints. But it's how you design test, it's, it's up to you. You, you can have 100% uh, verification go without any constraints, right? So it's really, there is no easy answer for this question. But I heard that people really randomize 10 different domains, which takes a lot of time. And in this particular case, for example, Python performance may be an issue. Hello, uh, nice work. The, do you ever use this on gate-level sims? Um, uh, on gate-level simulations? Uh, yeah, yeah, I use CocoTB for gate-level. It works very well. Yeah, but that's the problem with very later, because in very later, you actually cannot use uh, SDF, you cannot annotate SDF, you cannot use for gate lever, but in Icarus, for example, you can. 
So yes, I tried and it works. Have you used CocoaTB against Verilator? No, you cannot do that. It doesn't work, right? Yeah. Okay. Because Verilator would require VPI implementation. Yeah. Why VPI and not VPI? <laughs> <laughs> Just like the obvious question. Right? But you still can <laughs> use Icarus, and with Icarus, you can now with this framework use constraint random, use metrics. So you can have pretty much the same flow as you do in UVM. Yeah. Are you working on anything else at the moment, like any more CocoaTV extensions? At the, the moment, no. But moment. I'm planning to, yes. Like, a, what sort of stuff do you think is still missing? Uh, I think this stuff, what is implemented already, needs to be tested. <laughs> well, I, I you tested it. more. Yeah. yeah. I think you used it. Yeah. I did, yeah, yeah. But, uh, it was very good. So I'm wondering what else you got in the pipeline. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have other questions? Otherwise, let's thank the speaker again.